went and saw a grower after that meeting in Houston County, and the grower said to me, I'm going to tell you something, Bob. Okay? He said, 90% of the people in that room did not understand the word you said. 90%. So hopefully, I'm going to do better today. Okay? Or maybe we're smarter than what they were. I don't know. But the main thing is, when you leave here, you got the information you need to make the decisions you need to make. And most important is you know who to, what to ask your county agents using UGA extension. La Nina. La Nina. How many people ask me, boy, it's sure warm out there today, isn't it? Boy, it's sure dry out there today. I tell you what, you get on Twitter and you post what the impact of a La Nina, warmer and drier is, and you show some pictures of volunteer peanuts and regrowth cotton, and then you get some of the coldest weather we've had in decades. I tell you what, doesn't, it doesn't, more of it doesn't take long to become the butt of even more jokes than I already am. All right? We are in a La Nina situation. Last year was a classic La Nina because of the impact of the uh, warm equatorial waters on the jet stream. Typically, we push. Come on in, John. Typically, we push that uh, jet stream up. We don't get cold weather. We get dry weather. Okay, cold or warmer, drier weather. And we had that. We had that until about January 1st. So what we say is the winter was likely to be, well, it was warmer and drier. And it continues to be overall drier. We are in a moderate drought in which we're supposed to play now. We were warmer until January 1st. Okay. First point I want to make for cotton growers is from today until you plant your cotton seed, it makes sense to pay attention to what the climate's like, what the weather is. If I'm completely wrong and it goes in and continues to be cold, continues to be wet, that's a good thing for growers. If it is to be cold and wet going into the planting season, what's the number one disease we have to worry about? Seedling disease. The one disease I'm not going to talk about today. But what happens between now and planting time impacts, okay, if it remains or gets warmer again. Between now and planting time is warm, my biggest concern in cotton is those nematodes are going to wake up. Nematodes are going to wake up. Possible delay in severe frost, but we sure got one when it came, didn't we? Okay? Volunteers. Volunteers survive. That affects soybeans, it affects cotton, it affects peanuts. But as of January 1st, and over the next three weeks, we've had enough killing frost that we really don't have to worry about that now. I always get the question after I give a talk, especially in cotton, is it too late to pull nematode samples? Okay? I'll come back to that. Yes. Okay, this was always the way to sit back. It is too late. Why? Can we still pull them with those samples, John? We can. Can we learn something from them with those samples? Maybe. If we pull them with those sample now and it comes back with a lot of parasitic nematodes, root not nematodes, we know we got a problem. But if we pull the sample and we don't get anything, is that because they never were there or because they are now in an egg form? Uh, survival allows build up of nematodes. This Christmas gift you all could have, or New Year's gift is with these cold, freezing temperatures and cold soils. Once the temperature of the soil gets below 60 degrees, and as it gets closer and closer to 40 degrees, those nematodes go from feeding and being happy and doing whatever they do at 65 degrees. One in the house, Brock. When you get below, you get colder and colder, they suspend any kind of activity. In fact, the root knot nematode is only available in eggs. Why can't you find them? What's the problem with taking a nematode sample now? All you're going to find are eggs, and they are not diagnosed. You can't look at that and see. In fact, survival of those nematodes free is a great thing for girls. Okay? This was 2015. I showed this slide before. The cotton plant regrowth on January the 15th, 2015. Soils were warm. Plants were there. Nematodes were building. A population was active, increasing in number. And when you planted in 2015, the nematodes were ready for you. This is Tifton. This is January the 27th, 2017. We were in line for a situation like that. Soils were warm enough, plants were regrowth, we were building nematode populations up, and then we got the gift, the gift that's continued to give, and that is with cold soils. What's those nematodes doing right now? The nematodes right now are not doing much. Are we killing nematodes? Probably not, but most of the nematodes that are surviving, especially root dot, are in an egg form. As the soils warm up, the soils warm up, they will reemerge, especially if there's chemical signals from other hosts. Some of our winter weeds are hosts. Wheat's actually a mild host. Right? So if the soils get warm prematurely, we may have to worry about them with those again. So what does that matter? Based upon what happens between now and when you plant, 
is an indication how aggressive you should be in nematode management. Okay. It's much warmer than usual. I suggest you be more aggressive. If it remains cool or normal, which you normally do. The other thing, the wet weather out there, the wet weather we had yesterday, the wet weather we're going to have coming Sunday, that hastens the breakdown of the crop debris, the leaf, the leaf tissue, the stems. Okay. And that's important because why? If you've had a problem with target spot, if you've had a problem with bacterial blight, if you've had a problem with pent leaf spot, okay, it survives in the winter in that crop debris. Once you start to break that debris down with wet weather, okay, that helps to minimize the issue. Not, remember, not eliminate the minimum. Any questions on that? Any questions? By far, it's not the sexiest problem we've got right now in cotton. It's not the, uh, you know, if you had been here when I started, okay, I showed a picture of Stoneville, a Stoneville cotton cap right here, okay? But you just can't go back. Uh, you didn't say, it all said phytogen, it all said Hasbro on it, right? Okay, no matter how important bacterial blight may be, no matter how much I talk about target spot, no matter how much concern there was over areola mildew last year, the number one problem in my arena for <coughs> cotton growers in the southeast is and will always be southern root knot nematode. Southern root knot nematode is widespread. Southern root knot nematode causes significant losses. Southern root knot nematode probably costs growers as much or more than every other problem combined. Okay? It's not the only nematode. We talk about taking nematode samples. If you've got roots go up like this, and like this, if you've got stunted areas in the field, even if you don't pull a nematode sample, you know you've got a problem. Okay? By the way, I should talk quietly. Tell me that they can hear me in school. Okay? Um, so, there's a field in Tiff County that I would be working in this year. It was too late to get nematode samples. But I walked through the field, and I could see where they, they had chopped the stalks and they were laying on the ground. And they all look like that. I don't need a nematode sample to tell me if there's a problem. The second thing that a picture like this would do is if you have roots like this over a significant part of the field, that's an indication that a seed treatment nematicide is probably not what you're looking at. This much damage is indicative of needing a top treatment, a resistant variety, using telemark, something like that, because that amount of damage, a seed treatment or nematodes will walk through some of the lower or some of the, uh, the, the less aggressive treatments. <coughs> it's important to know the nematodes. Okay? It's important to know the nematodes. Tim showed me in one field uh, in Berrien County when you were there, I was convinced we were going to look at fusarium wilt and root knot nematode. And we pulled up the plants, and this isn't the same picture, but we looked at the roots and there was no galling on them at all. No. Okay? It was staining nematode. In this case, Bryn Allen called me to Washington County. He said, everything about it looks like nematodes. But it's not nematodes because when you look at the roots, they're clean. The patterns in the field, the stunting in the field look just like nematodes. Well, this was reniform nematode. Just because you don't see these galls does not mean you don't have a nematode problem. It means you don't have the root nematode. In this area, you could have sting nematode. As we move further north and east, it could be reniform nematode or north and west could be reniform nematode. When you get into Alabama, they're going to be more concerned with the in general than root knot nematode. We have to have some sort of soil sampling, some sort of diagnostics to tell us what the problem is unless we see the galls. This is an advertisement. Get questions all the time from growers and from agents and consultants. I planted peanuts last year. What's the impact on my rotation for corn this year? Or I've been in bahia grass for two years and I'm thinking about moving to cotton. This publication, Plant Susceptibility, Susceptibility to Major Nematodes in Georgia, that talks about what nematodes go to which crops. If you plant tobacco and then you go into peanuts, what's the impact of it? You can get this from your county agent, they can print it off for you, or you can look for it on a search engine and find it. Another one is this, Guide for Interpreting Nematode Assay Results. We get results back of a cotton sample that has 400 ring nematodes in it, Brock, and people say, well, what's the 400 ring nematodes going to do? Nothing. Okay. Probably nothing unless you grow blueberries. Okay. This will tell you when you look. Here's my nematodes. Here's my cow score. Can I find out how it's going to impact it? So two publications that I suggest you consider. Okay. Any questions on that? Let's talk about resistant varieties. Okay. 
Resistant varieties are increasingly important in our management of the root dot method. Now, Marvin, in 2019 or 2020 or something, I'm expecting that you're going to have a variety which is resistant to both reniform and root. Okay? I haven't seen it, but I hear great things are coming. Until that point, the varieties you see on the screen are the ones which have resistance to the root knot network. If you plant one of these varieties, or more than one of these varieties, I can guarantee you two things if you plant them in a field with southern root knot network. First thing I can guarantee you is they are going to have less damage to that root system than would a variety which does not have resistance. Okay? How does this resistance work? The first gene. Some have two genes, some have one gene. The first gene, it does this. The female nematode still gets in the root, still gets in the root, but there's not in recognition of a signal from her to the root which forms a giant cell which turns into a gall. The nematode still penetrates, the nematode still gets in the root. It's just that galling you see never develops. What happens when the galling doesn't develop? You don't disrupt the root function. And if you don't form that gall, the female doesn't do what? She doesn't reproduce. She doesn't reproduce. So the two things that happen, if you plant one of these varieties, you have less damage to the root system, which means less disruption of root function, and you have less chemical build up at the end of the season. Example would be, you plant a susceptible variety like 1646 from Delta At the end of the season, you wind up with 400 root knot nematodes per 100 cc of soil. If you plant 1558, 400 versus five. So the two things that happen. You have less chemical buildup, and you have less damage to the root. What's the one thing I can't promise to the grower? What's the reason why not every grower plants things when they probably could benefit from it? Yield, okay? And not necessarily yields. The lower the nematode population, the more likely a nematocyte complement of the variety would benefit, okay? Two genes are better than one gene, why? Two genes not only inhibit the function of that giant cell keep the female from reproducing, but the second gene, its, its use is unclear. It's unclear, or its, its mechanism is unclear, but they're better. Two genes together result in less damage and in less tilt. <clears throat> Third thing to say, you'll notice an asterisk here and an asterisk there. If they have an asterisk, they are reported to have resistance to bacterial blight and the root not nematode. If there is no asterisk, they are reported to be resistant to the root knot nematode, but not bacterial blight. Great example. The poster children for bacterial blight in 2016 and 2017 have been those two varieties. If we're going to find bacterial blight in 2016 or 2017, we're going to find it in those two varieties first. But they are extremely resistant to root knot nematode. The grower has to make a decision. Am I more afraid of what bacterial blight might do and I'm plant a variety like that, or am I more assured of what nematodes will do and I'll plant a resistant variety? <laughs> Good news is, as we move forward, not that these are the varieties to take everything away, but 480 and 440 are important to have resistance to both. So we're moving towards varieties that are not only resistant to root knot, bacterial blight as well. Any questions on that? What are some of the map size we have available? Just a cartoon that shows. Why do we talk in 2018? Why am I glad you're here? It's lonely if you're not here. Okay. The other thing is, we jump back to 2000 when I started. What on that chart was here in 2000? Okay. I've only been here 18 years. What's that? Vidate was here. Why did you mention Vidate? Because Vidate has come back. We haven't had much Vidate since about, since about four or five years ago. Okay. Vidate is not anywhere near a magic gold, silver gold. Okay? Vidate does have one advantage, though, is once you've done what you think you can do, when you close that furrow, Vidate is something that can be sprayed as a foliar application between the fifth leaf stage and about the next square, and it does give you an option. Not a great option, but it gives you an option. Okay? So Vidate was one. And what's the other one that was there? Tell them. Nothing else here was here in 2000. Now, ag logic has come back. That's replaced what? It's a tenant. Okay? It's replaced tenant. So it's back as well. Okay? But really, everything else here, we've had a whole revolution in the use of seed treatments. Okay? So how are we going to control nematodes? Parasitic nematodes. First thing is we have to know what type we have. If it's root, not nematode, we have 
varieties we've talked about. Okay. I've learned something. I think, and I'm not a full grower, I'm not a cotton grower, and it's not true in every case, but what I believe is this. Growers, in my experience, put premium on yield potential. I could show, I could talk resistance all day long, and if you look and see the yield potential is not there, it's a tough uphill battle. The second thing is the amount of emphasis put on convenience. You want to believe, okay? And when we talk about managing nematodes, if you're going to use them outside, nothing is more convenient than having treated seed and putting seed treatments out there. And now we have things like a Victor Complete Pack. We have Copio Prime. We now have BioST from Alba. We still have some Aris out there. Okay? Seed treatments are convenient. Seed treatments are nematicides, but the absolute truth is they don't have the punch of these other nematicides. Okay. Those gall roots I showed you, you're going to hurt your feelings if you think I'm going to put a seed treatment out and I'm going to solve that problem. In my experience, seed treatments work when you don't necessarily recognize, when you suspect there might be a problem, or you suspect you've got a rotation issue. If you can go to a field and ask, actually see where the damage is across the field, that probably tells you that this is not what you need. But they are nematocytes. They do have a place. They do work. But they work on a limited basis. What do we have out there? Okay. Telome. Telome stands alone in terms of management. Telome stands alone in terms of ability to control nematodes in 2018. Doesn't matter what kind of nematode. You now we're worried about root knot here. These nematocytes don't care what kind of nematode. Reniform, root knot, columbia lamp, stem nematode. That one will have a couple Achilles heels, both Achilles heels, okay? It's not convenient. Okay? If you put a premium on convenient, this is not what it's most effective. The second thing is, if I was talking to a group of potato farmers in Oregon or Washington State, we could probably find a lot of them. But cotton growers in Georgia, we got to scramble for them. Okay? There'll be a limited supply, and they don't give it away. It's not cheap, but it's the best. It's a way of making money. Most of what you're saying is, uh, is a mix because of the short of What's that? Because the cell on being so short after a mix, what's the effect of that? Mix? I'm not sure what the mix is. I don't know what to call it. It's cell on and go big. That may be for vegetables. I'm not sure if it's cotton growers. If it is for cotton growers, it's all they had in the last couple of years. Well, it's out of my, all I know on cotton is the, is the value of cell on. Okay. What I would say is, if you can't, if you need telon, you should use telon. If you can't get all you want, I wouldn't say, well, I'm supposed to put three gallons out. I'm going to put one and a half gallons out and hope for the best. I wouldn't do that. What I would do is, whether you're looking at soil conductivity, Calvin Perry in the back is kind of like the godfather in Georgia of this strategy. You know, look at site-specific applications. Look at soil conductivity, look at soil texture, the sand of the soil, more likely you are to have a root nematode problem, or look at yield maps. If you can see in the area where you suspect you not have those, okay? treat what you can treat. Okay? Treat what's most important, so site specific applications. Now, why don't more growers do that? Caldwell County, we don't have to convince any growers. They do it anyway. Okay? But it adds an additional layer of complication on the use of telem to not just go out and treat the whole field. But if you can't get the telem you need, or if you want to cut back on the cost, use it where it's most effective. Site specific applications are where to go. It's absolutely, but it, it, better management leads to better control. Okay. Or better. Right. The big question we have is what about ag logic and selling total? Okay. Ag logic is very close to what Tenek used to be, where a gypsum formulation now, what was the difference? We're using a gypsum formulation of ag logic. What's the difference between that and what we used to use with Tenek? We used to mainly use a corn crop, corn cob, or a brick formulation. Why don't we use that now? Because they don't produce it, they want to produce chips as fast. What's the other big difference between ag logic and tech? Starting with P and N and E. Press, yep, right? So, I mean, it's an investment for the buyer and for the company. So, my experience is this using ag logic on cotton, granular insecticide nematicide, at five pounds per acre has been, in my arena, has been very close to 16 to 18. 16 to 18 ounces of velum total. I've seen good things with velum total. Is velum total bulletproof? That's a liquid in the furrow spray. Okay? 
It has admitted open for thrips control, which is going to give you better thrips control, probably with ag life in most situations. The development total is going to have the medical open for thrips control, which is adequate, and the 16 to 18 ounce, in my experience, the 14 ounce will work as well. It looked very close and sometimes is good or better than the ag life. If you tell me you're using one or the other, my concern is not that you're using one of these products. My concern is, are you putting them in the right field? Because Billy, it's true, Bellum works very well, but you put it in a field that's decimated by nematodes, you may wish you had something else. But for moderate populations, it works very well. Just to show you some data. The first thing is the use of a resistant variety. This is Jeremy Kickler's data from Colquitt County. This is the nematode population at the end of the season. If you plan to find 1558, which is what? Bacterial blight susceptible or root not nematode resistant. In 2017, that was our population nematode, 48. If you look at 1646, 1646 plus ag logic, 1646 plus telone, you can see the nematode population had bumped almost eight to nine times. This is almost as if you planted peanuts in a cotton field as far as nematode buildup. This is what happens even if you use telum. Telum does not season long suppress nematode populations. Okay? When you look at the nematode damage in the season, almost no root not nematode damage where we had the 1558. Okay? By the end of the season, we had moderate nematode popular damage to roots. Um, this is about 15% of the root was affected. Okay? The main thing is this best picture of the whole thing, but made it all worthwhile. We have 1646, which is bacterial blight resistant, but susceptible to nematodes. We found no bacterial blight in this field. So we planted 1558, I mean, we planted 1646, hoping to avoid bacterial blight. We found none. So you have a susceptible variety with nothing to protect against nematodes, with ag logic and with telone, and you had 1558 by itself, which does not need the telone. And this is the problem, this is where it gets complicated for growers. If you plant the 1558 in that field, which was a troubled field, we made 763 pounds of length. Okay? If you planted 1646 by itself, and this moderate level of field, we made 40 pounds of length. Okay? By planting the resistant variety. When we planted the ag line, use the ag logic. Alright? We made 35 pounds per acre more than we did with the 1558. What did this do? Less damage, less nematode buildup by adding ag logic. At five pounds, five times six and a half, close to forty dollars an acre, we made that much more time. The big one. We made a hundred and nearly hundred pounds of lint more when we used the telephone versus when we used uh, 1558. This is the problem. If 1558 was as big a yield as 1646, there'd be no question. What makes it difficult for the growers is, where's the break point? Am I better to plant a higher yielding variety, in this case 1646 versus 1558, and use the nematicide with it? If you look at 70 cent cotton, you made more money using telone on it than you would have. The value of that cotton was more than, even with the telone, than the 1558 by itself. That's why it gets complicated. Okay. Any questions on that? Here's an example of where it didn't work. In this case, we could have planted 1646 to Copeland County, moderate root not nematodes, treated with nematicide, and made more money than we would have by not treating the 1558 for nematodes. Okay? Here's an example where that didn't work. This drawer was in Bullet County. This drawer was so afraid of bacterial blight that he planted his delta fine variety with resistance and did not worry about the nematodes. He put out a little bit of ag logic. And you can see the impact. In this situation, his work, 1646, his yield was almost nothing in that field. He didn't have a bit of bacterial blight, okay? but he didn't have anything to harvest either. And this is where it's got to come in. If you're going to plant a high yielding bacterial blight resistant variety, you've got to think about what the impact is going to be. Or it's going to be. Any questions on that? BioST. I put this in there because there's been a lot of questions in Northwest, Northeast Georgia over the past couple of days. Or BioST. It is a seed tree. I'm not even exactly sure what's not organic. It just has it made from biological derivatives from the bacteria. Question is, how good is it? Because we got copial prime out there, we got fluid pyrim out there, 
that this would probably be a something similar to copio prime. Okay? We've got a victim out there. And this is looking at the root knot nematodes per 100 cc of soil on the 6th of June. Well, I'm sorry, this is root gall, not that's wrong. It's a root gall rating. So a scale of 0 to 10. If you didn't treat it all, here is their base seed tree. Okay? This would be the copio early in the season. If you take that BioST from Alba and you add a couple things with it, their systemic acquired resistance or orthene or the experimental bacteria side, you get even lower. Okay? Main thing is this at the end of the season, BioST versus that fluopyram C treatment. The BioST was 1.6. Unless you added something with the BioST, it was not as good as the fluopyram. If you got questions on BioST, we got a little bit of data on it. It is effective, it does work, okay? but it's no better, certainly no better than the other seed treatment we got out The question I had, or the comment I heard was, BioST is as good as five pounds of agalogic. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Believe it fits, it's no better. Any questions on that? Why do I show this limited data? Because I'm getting questions all the time. I hear BioST is as good as using agalogic or bellum total. I don't see it, but it does fit. Questions? Fusarium wilt. Fusarium wilt is an extremely important problem. It's hard to manage. We can see it in fields in southwest Georgia, southeast Georgia, especially this Tifton area. It's kind of an epicenter from it. Fusarium wilt in Georgia does not exist without a nematode partner. The nematode partner we typically see it with is the root knot nematode. But what we're learning more and more in Georgia is it's the sting nematode, which is a problem. In nine out of 10 fields with this disease, Come to the plant, interventor chlorosis. Split the stem, and you see the interventor chlorosis. That's the fusarium that's got in there and plugged up the vascular tissue. Nine out of ten times associated with the sting nematode. That means what? If it's associated with the sting nematode, what's one management decision that won't work? If the fusarium and the nematodes go hand in hand and it's sting nematode, you cannot use a resistant variety to your profile. Because these varieties are not resistant to sting nematodes. <coughs> Pictures are worth a thousand words. This is in Tatma County two years ago. This is what the fusarium will look like where you used nothing, and this is what Bellum Total did, 16 ounces. This is Chris Goodman's field two years ago. We saw the same thing this year. Chris Goodman on the right-hand side is where Telehome was put out. On the left-hand side is where nothing was put out. I asked Chris, did his exact words, I said, Chris, did you make money Using telephone. He said, Are you smoking crack? He said, I made a thousand pounds of land before I used it. But data from his field this year. This is the severity of Fusarium wood. Terrible area. Okay? I made a cloaker on the far right. All that did was control the insects or the thrips. This is a combination of sting nematode and Fusarium wood. What gives me confidence in vellum total and ag logic is that's the amount of fusarium wilt when you use either the vellum total at 16 ounces or the ag logic at 5 ounces. A lot of times I see that. Their button heads are working similarly to each other. And that's the amount of fusarium wilt. When you look at plant height, again, the telon was a little bit higher, but at this point in time, the main difference was that we have an amide out there or not, whether the vellum total, telon, or ag logic better than the medical Unfortunately, this field was devastated by or really strongly affected by the hurricane. We didn't get the yields out we wanted, but we do have another field we looked at. This was in Tatlin County last year. And again, this is the percent severity of fusarium wilt early in the season. Far right is the In the middle is vellum total and ag logic. Again, very difficult situation. The two treatments are looking very similar to each other. And this is what telling is. Okay? When we look at yields, all right? Even though the ag logic and the vellum total early on were looking very good, by the end of the season, this is the difference. A thousand pound increase over the next best treatment by using the What does that mean? You got a significant problem with your serum wilt, that means a significant problem with the nematodes as well. Make sure you put the right treatment, depending on how bad it is. You know, putting out vellum total or ag logic may be better or may not be better. Okay. Questions on that? Questions. Foliar disease of cotton. I just want to focus on this one first. Aerial ignore. We see this all the time in Atkinson County, Coffee County. 
We see it in Pierce County, Wayne County. It's something that shows up periodically. We'll see it a little bit every year. Usually it shows up so late in the season that it really doesn't matter. Okay? Last year it showed up much earlier. Last year it showed up across the coastal plain of Georgia. What's it look like? It looks like powdery mildew on other crops. The sporulation is most often most severe on the underside of the leaf. It quickly dries the leaf up, the leaf falls off, you have premature defoliation, and it looks like something like this. Okay? In most situations, in most years, even if you get that premature defoliation, it doesn't matter. In 2007, we had a trial in Appalachian County. It's the first time I ever saw a response to fungicide with cotton. That's where we did the treat. That's two applications of headline. Okay? It worked very well. We can control aerial and milk. And we took this to yield. And the yield difference between this and this was basically negligible. This is why I'm so cautious, so cautious in saying to growers, the spray. Can we reduce the impact on defoliation, premature defoliation of aerial oil milk with well tied points of that application? We can. Yes, we can. But how likely are we to see a yield response that pays for that application? My recommendations, based upon the limited information we have, if you are more than three weeks away from when you would defoliate your cotton, you're more than three weeks away, you're seeing this disease show up in the field, and you are more than three weeks away from defoliating, I would be concerned. I would be concerned because very quickly it can drop those leaves off. The second thing I would say is this. If you see the disease coming in and the bowls at the top of the plant are mature, they're firm, they're hard, they're not open yet, but they're made, they just got to open up, I wouldn't worry about this disease. But if you still got bowls you expect to make and they're not fully developed, that's when I would be concerned about it. That's when I'd be concerned about it. If you ask me how much data do we have on this for Georgia or any other place, most people wouldn't even talk about it. This is about the extent of it. But it's an educated guess. If we have disease out there and we need to be making cotton and we got more than three weeks to go before we <coughs> put a million out there, that's when I would expect a potential to drop. <coughs> if it comes in later than that, it may actually help us in opening the canopy up, less bowl on it. Any questions on that? Um, do you have any what, what causes that disease? What causes that disease? Yeah. Granularity. I mean, what? Oh, what conditions cause it? Okay. It's caused by warm, moist conditions. And for some reason, so a lot of fungal do that, that doesn't tell you much. Right? The warm, moist conditions. But it's, for whatever reason, it's most problematic in Tiff County, south and east. We typically don't see it in other areas. Okay. Is there a resistance in varieties? Not that we know of. I mean, there may be, but it's not something that's talked about. 2008, 2017, was problematic because we saw a lot more than we expected to see. And it came in more aggressively and earlier. And then you compound growers anxiety on top of you've already got white flies out there and it's a bad situation. We may never see it again other than in where it has been. The main thing is that what I want you to walk away from here is recognizing what it is, recognizing that most growers in most situations don't need to do anything about it unless it comes in so early and it's going to prematurely defoliate your crop and affect the opening and the maturing of the crop. And we can control it with the uh, fungicide. Yes, sir. So then it's able to overwinter in the same crop, what you're saying? Or does yeah, it, it will overwinter. Okay. It will overwinter crop debris. And again, that's one reason why I'm glad we're having moisture out there. You know, if you got to be wrong, you want to be wrong. Like, if I got to be wrong, and the butt of more jokes, okay, I'd rather be wrong where I predicted it was going to be very favorable for disease and I was wrong, as opposed to saying it was going to be unfavorable turned out. The moisture we've got out there right now is going to break those leaves down. It should help to break this into another one. Okay. <coughs> Great question. Did you see any, any varieties worse than others? There were reports of varieties where it was, but I, for me, I mean, the consultants who were out there in the field, Brandon, you may have seen something as well. I didn't see where I could say one was more severe than the other. It was more for me, it was more location. Great question. Target spot, Mississippi. Mississippi, there's a consultant out of Mississippi and I saw Tom Allen, who's my counterpart in Mississippi. He tweeted something and he said, uh, I've looked at all the data from the Southeast and I believe that from their data, 
you make a profit by treating targets by 20% of the time when you put a fungicide out. And therefore, I am not recommending that Mississippi growers use a fungicide <coughs> because it's too unpredictable. 20% of the time they make money, 80% of the time they don't. Okay? I think that's appropriate for what Mississippi may do. They're experiencing this epidemic. Now they're looking. What I can tell you in Georgia is this. The data that he's looking at is a limited, though a very good data set from Cotton Corporate. I can say from our other trials, and they're not part of that, we are batting better than one. I'll also say with Target Spot, if simply because you grow cotton, you're going to spray your cotton for Target Spot, if you grow cotton in Georgia and you spray it because of that, I think that's a mistake. But if you look at your yield potential, you look at the field history, you look at the weather that you're at, if you narrow your focus down, if you anticipate there may be a benefit because it takes two weeks to go from this to this when you got a bad situation and the potential for 200 pounds of lint, it would be a mistake to say, I'm not going to spray because the data from the Cotton Corporate trial shows 20% of the time we're effective across the entire belt. Tennessee, Mississippi, North Carolina, Virginia don't get the target spot. So for cotton growers in this room, or in the state of Georgia, I think it would be a mistake to simply say, because that data says 20% of the time it pays for itself, we've got to be more careful. But I would say we don't necessarily have to treat every single time. What's available? In 2007, when we sprayed for that aerial and mildew, we had two products. We had quadrus and we had headline. It's become a crowded market. If nothing else, there's a lot of interest from those <coughs> sale products. And what's happened in 2000, in 17, in 16, 16, 17, now we have pre-axial. This remains our standard. It's replaced headlines our standard. The latest is now labeled, okay? Proline from Bear Crop Science. A big one's Azoxy Star. That's Azoxy Strobin. That's a generic formulation. Now, growers who say, I don't know if I should spray or not. I don't know if I should. Now we've got a generic formulation that we spray out there. Of not the best chemistry, but a good chemistry, okay? So we have a lot of things out there. I'll show this data from 2016 one more time. Consultant working with the grower. The consultant had never recommended spraying for <coughs> target spot because he felt the grower would be wasting money. The grower, Mike Newberry, early county, he had good cotton. He had target spot, not a lot, but moderate. The untreated, he made close to 1,400 pounds of length. Most growers would say, if that's what target spot does to my crop, bring it on. Bring me target spot if I give me 1,400 pounds. Again, this was a moderate level, not too bad. This is a single application of reactual or bloom, two applications at first and third week of bloom, three applications at first, third, and fifth. And this is the value above the untreated in terms of cost of application and fungicide. In that situation, with a moderate level of target spot, he made money <coughs> at the Point to you, you were out there, right? He made Mike made money by spray. Okay? He had never done it before one. He was making this. So the point to growers is, if making 1400 versus 1530 doesn't excite you, or 1400 versus 1600 doesn't excite you, then don't worry about it. Okay? But this is what the potential is for. Us. Questions on that? <coughs> Questions. All right. Last one. Bacterial blight. Bacterial blight has been and continues to be a disease of increasing concern across the southeast. I have a publication up here that's from Cotton Incorporated okay, on the back. And Brandon, again, I'm calling you. I think you were one of the ones. we got a map on the back. One of the ones who helped to get them that data. Let's give credit where credit's due. Showing the spread of this disease. The main thing I want to see. 2016, we saw bacterial blight come in. Very important disease. 2000, uh, 2050, on 1454, the poster child. 2000, and 16 came in on 1558, 2017 on 1747. We have had bacterial blight. We're talking with Mark Mitchell, a consultant, Mark says bacterial blight is in Decatur County, one of the hardest hit areas of bacterial blight. He says, Bob, between now and when our growers select and plant their seed, bacterial blight is critically important. After that, there's not much we can do about it. But choosing good seed is important. Okay? What do symptoms look like? These greasy, angular spots, it's a bacterial disease. Sometimes as it progresses, you'll get a yellow halo around the spots, okay? <coughs> we can get this lightning bolt appearance. Disease can go systemic. You can see the multiple disease spots on this leaf and it leads to rapid premature defoliation, okay? 
The big difference between target spot and bacterial blight at this point is A, with target spot, we can do what? We can take a fungicide out. Bacterial blight, there is nothing. We can do other than try and manage irrigation to reduce overwater, over uh, irrigating to keep the conditions a little bit dry. The other difference is bacterial blight can go systemic, okay? It can move in the plant. And of course, perhaps the most important difference, in addition to we can't spread anything for it, is the fact it will affect the bowls. And when it affects the bowls, bowl rot can be increased and you can have bowl drop as well. Right? So it's certainly nothing we need to ignore. It's nothing we need to, it's something we need to be aware of. Right? Where does the bacterial blight come from? It come in on infected or infested soil. Why is bacterial blight such a concern for growers in Georgia and the Southeast? A, it's something new. It's something new. B, it's something we can't treat for once it's in the field. And C, you paid a lot of money for that bag of seed and to think that may come in on that seed just doesn't sit there. Right? Where is it also surviving? Plant residues. The warmer and the drier it is, especially the drier it is, the more likely it is to go from one seed to the next. If we break that residue down like the rain we had, the rain we we're going to have Sunday or Saturday, that helps us work. Okay? Coming in on the seed. Last year in our variety trial, we had variety trials across the state now ready for With the exception of Delta Pine 1747, it was nearly impossible to find that disease. We could find a little bit in some of the varieties, but never. But 1747, it wasn't every one of them, but it was in a number. And so we took the seed from the entire seed lots, we looked, it was sent to Iowa State, we had them look. Not that they couldn't have missed it, but we did check every variety, we didn't find it in the seed. Okay? What do I think happened with 1747 last year? Do I know that it didn't come in anywhere in the seed? I don't know that. But what I think is more likely is the variety is just super susceptible. And even if it was in the seed, which is good news, it's good news. It means it's something in it, just there's a native population out there which is going to get out. Right? Survival between crop and debris, I think this is important. Right? Uh, last thing. Okay? How are we going to manage this in 2018? Now, based upon what I saw in 2017, I'm going to tell you this. If you plant a variety, if you plant a variety which is recognized as being susceptible to bacterial blight in 2018, there is the real possibility you will see. Will it cause you a loss? I don't know, but there's a very real possibility you'll see. If you plant a variety which is reported as being resistant to bacterial blight in 2018, I don't believe it's going to be a problem at all. A susceptible variety, I don't know. We've got to add up. What's the impact of an nematode resistant variety versus bacterial blight? We plant a resistant variety, I don't think we need to worry about. What's resistant? Okay. This is our list of 2017. Okay. Here's the 2018 lineup of new varieties. Okay. I will say this. Any of these varieties, <coughs> from phytogen, they've been reported to be resistant. I have no reason to doubt that. From next gen, okay, 5711, resistant. I don't expect to plant this variety to have any problem with resistance. Stone 5818, 5122, and 5471, I don't expect a problem with bacterial blight. And then 1820 and 1840, from Delta Pine, I don't expect a problem. 1851 would have partial resistance. Okay. Would I plant 1747 in 2018? I would if I got a big nematode problem. But the closer I am to the southwest corner of the state, the more I'm going to avoid it. Where it's been a real problem. There are other varieties, new phytogen varieties, for example, that have resistance to both nematodes and back to the plant. But we've got to consider what was the real cost in 2017 of the disease versus the nematode. But the main thing I want to leave you with on this, if you plant a resistant variety of bacterial blight, my experience is, based upon looking at those trials last year, and not seeing develop, disease develop at all, while it did develop on the 1747, this will help you. What do I want to leave you with? Okay. What's the weather going to be like between now and planting? What's the weather going to be like between now and planting, and how will that affect your disease and the man? Your variety selection. Like Mark Mitchell said, bacterial blight is critically important between now and when you buy your seed. Because when you plant that seed, you have made your major decisions about nematodes and bacterial blight. 
Yield and convenience. Yield and convenience are king and queen. Right? But if you go only by yield and convenience, how do you give up on resistance? Okay. You may have to give that up, and is that a good decision? Bacterial blight and target spot. Both of them cause premature defoliation. Target spot, we have the management ops to the fungicides. Bacterial blight, obviously, we know. Nematodes and fusarium will. That sting nematode is going to impact us on what kind of hematocyte we move across. And clearly, the more severe, severe it is, our options are limited. And the aerial is no longer. Will we see it again this year? Some growers will. But let's not overreact. Okay? Any questions for me? Any questions? I have up here, I have, if you want this new publication from Cotton Incorporated on bacterial blight, it's here, okay? The other thing is, we've got hopefully an hour for private or commercial pesticide application. You can call this class plant pathology, fill it out, and leave it up here for me to take. And I'll stick around and answer any questions you can. Okay? Appreciate y'all being here.